beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> what an amazing phenomenon it must have been that day Christ poured out His Spirit. It grasps our spiritual imagination as we hear the wind and see the flames and hear the followers of the Ascended Lord experiencing a speaking and a hearing wonder, miracle. Many children's Bible, Bibles try to capture the events of Pentecost in some fascinating description and a picture of men with raised hands and flames on their, hand, on their heads, etc. Yet it's indeed hard to get a complete picture of what took place on the tenth day after Jesus' ascension. Often on a day like today, or maybe Lord's Day 20 is preached on, the focus is on the Sermon of Peter, or on the speaking in tongues. But this morning, we'll hear God's Word on the significance of the powerful signs of wind and fire by which the Spirit showed His outpouring. For, beloved, they are not less important than the other elements of this grateful event. Also, these signs had been promised by Jesus at the outpouring of the Spirit. He sent His disciples into the world with the Gospel, but they were not to go in their own strength. If they have gone in their own strength, nothing would have happened. Yet with the powerful appearance of the Holy Spirit in wind and fire, people understood what happened. They understood what the disciples were sent for. And there are two of them. One is the wind, or rather sound like the blowing of a violent wind which came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And the other is fire. Verse 3 says, They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And then following the filling of the Spirit, resulting in the disciples speaking different languages. It's remarkable in this that the Spirit's outpouring is not in the first place the speaking of tongues which is so famous among Pentecostal churches. But the way the Holy Spirit was presented to the disciples in wind and fire. And thus, if you want to understand what the powerful coming of the Spirit mean, meant, these are the images by which we must do so. Because the powerful appearance of the Spirit will also strengthen us in these days, using our spiritual gifts to spread the gospel among others. And therefore, I have summarized the message in our text as follows. The powerful coming of the Spirit in first wind, second fire. The powerful coming of the Spirit in, first of all, wind. Brothers and sisters, in our daily conversations, we speak about wind. When we speak about wind, we normally do not in the first place think about the Holy Spirit. However, in both the major ancient languages, Greek and Hebrew, and even Latin, which was spoken widely in that, that time, the word for spirit was also used for wind or breath. So when Acts 2 verse 2 says that they heard a sound as of a rushing mighty wind, wind also means spirit. As a result, no one who normally thought in or sp spoke in Greek, Hebrew or Latin would have missed the symbolism. The Hebrew word for wind or spirit is ruach, and the Greek word is pneuma, and the Latin word is spiritus. 
And so in these three great an ancient languages, a person could not say the word for spirit without using breath or wind as part of the sound, implying wind. Besides this, the wind or spirit is often combined in scriptures. This is not surprising as the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1 verse 1 and 2 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the ruach, the wind, the breath, the spirit of God was hovering over the face of of the waters. Now in English the choice of words might not mean a lot, a whole lot to us. We think perhaps of the Holy Spirit as a dove somehow skimming over the waters that were covering the earth at that time. But that is not the picture. Rather the Holy Spirit of God is portrayed as a divine life-giving wind that is blowing across the waters at the beginning. And in the next chapter, we have the story of the creation of Adam from the dust of the ground. And in Genesis 2 verse 7 we read, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and Ruach breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, the spirit of life, and man became a living being, which indicates that apart from the breath of God, man was just dead matter. He was as dead as dust. In order for man to have life, God, who is also the source of life, had to breathe some of his life, some of his divine breath or spirit into Adam. Only then, through that ruach, that wind, that breath of the Spirit of God, did Adam become a living being. This life-giving wind or spirit of God also brought the bones to life as described in Ezekiel 37. In verse 5 of this chapter, God says, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Projecting what will happen to Israel also on the day of Pentecost. And in verse 14 he says, I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land, and then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Which means, beloved, the, the Jews near the house where the disciples were together could not be confused when Peter indicated this phenomenon as the coming of God's Spirit. Now this Spirit is also working spiritually. This we see in John 3. When the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to Nicodemus about the new birth, and he picks up on this idea. He tells Nicodemus, not merely that the person needs to be regenerated in some mystical way in order to have eternal life or to be saved, but he or she needs to be born again. And here Jesus uses a word for again that actually means again, just like in the first time, from above. That is, Jesus said that a person needs to be born again from above like and through the Ruach. What was Jesus getting at? Nicodemus did not know. He hadn't the faintest idea. Therefore he asked, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? But then Jesus explained using the same word here for wind and spirit. Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and wind, spirit, and Jesus 
uses here the word pneumatos, which is the same as ruach. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the pneumatos, the spirit, is spirit. Do not marvel, Jesus said, when I said this to you. You must be born again. The wind, the pneuma, the ruach, blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit, the pneumatos. Now Nicodemus did not understand Jesus. But we can. If we put these things together, Think of what is said at the creation of Adam in the beginning. God breathed into Adam so that he became a living being. His spirit was the vehicle. And now we find Jesus saying that the new life that all people need, it needs to be breathed into them in the same way to God's creation of Adam. So just as in the beginning God breathed into Adam so that he became a living physical being, so also in our days, for a person to be saved, God must breathe into him or her by his Spirit. And again, this happens from above, just like the first time, so that the person might become spiritually alive. That is what Pentecost really is about. Now We may be physically alive without the new birth, but if we want to become and stay spiritually alive, we must, God must breathe His Spirit into us. The image of wind in Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus was not an extraneous idea, as it seems to us. No, it was a vivid way of talking about the Spirit's work, which even Nicodemus must have recognized. The Spirit of Christ is the source of all breath, the source of all life, also of our spiritual life. And therefore, beloved, we need to trust God to give us the breath we need to live spiritually and to carry on to the very end. Now, when we put all this all together, we begin to, be, uh, begin to get a sense of why the image of wind is so important in Acts 2. Because when verse 2 speaks about the sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind which filled the whole house where they were sitting, that sound, that sounds very much like the story of the Spirit of God hovering over the waters of the earth at creation. It means that here in Acts, we have a new creation. Just as important as the original creation of the heavens and the earth. Because this heaven and earth are destined to pass away. But what is done by the Spirit at Pentecost is eternal. Pentecost is a life-breathing experience by which, as Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. And obviously the coming of the Holy Spirit as a rushing mighty wind was meant to symbolize the coming of the creative power of God to inaugurate a new era in which men and women should be brought to spiritual life. And congregation, this he does not only powerfully, but also complete. Because our text speaks about filth. And it occurs twice. The house in which the disciples were sitting was filled. And then, they themselves were filled by the Holy Spirit. This means that the early believers did not become Christians at Pentecost. They already were believers. They believed in Jesus. They were meeting together in His name. They were praying and studying Scripture. 
But now the Holy Spirit came upon them in a special way, filling them, empowering them for their task. And therefore the word filled is used. Whenever Christians were filled with the Holy Spirit, they testify forcefully and effectively about Jesus Christ. It is not primarily that they spoke in tongues, though this did occur at Pentecost and possibly elsewhere. It is not that they did miracles, though occasionally miracles were performed. No, filling them means that they were able and empowered to verbally testify about Jesus Christ. In Acts 2, the emphasis is upon the fact that everyone heard and will hear about Jesus. So if you ask whether a person is spirit-filled, the only way to answer the question is by determining whether or not he or she speaks often and effectively about Jesus. It is not by whether he or she speaks in an unintelligible language or, or does miracles. The question is, does he or she testify to Jesus Christ? And does God bless the testimony in the conversion of men and women? And for that, the Spirit powerfully equip the church of the new covenant to do so. It reminds me of a story that I once read or a comparison of a pearl diver who lives at the bottom of the ocean by means of pure air, wind, ruach, conveyed to him from above. His life is entirely dependent on the breath from above him. And so we are down here like the diver to gather pearls for our master, for our master's crown. And for that, the source of our life comes from the life-giving Spirit. He not only came in wind, He also came in fire. That's our second point. Brothers and sisters, it is remarkable that in the second sign, Luke does not just speak about fire or single little flames, but tongues of fire. And there is something in that. Because tongues are that by which we speak. James 3 verse 6 compares the tongue with a fire. So in this second sign for the Holy Spirit in the account of Pentecost where they sp spoken about fire, it involves, about, it involves speaking or talking. Words given by the Spirit to speak. That's the first and important aspect. Yet there's more to this image than only speaking. Because if you look at fire and the symbolism in the Bible, there's a lot of evidence of God's presence and God's power in fire. If you go back to the Old Testament again, we see that quite often fire is a symbol of God's presence. The earliest instance we read about in Genesis 15, where God made His covenant with Abram. Abram had a vision. The vision was of God, suggested by symbols. And Abram had performed an ancient rite of covenant making. He had cut the animals apart and put them in two rows on the ground. It was customary in his day for the two parties of the covenant to walk between the separated parts of the animals and take their vows there. The vow was understood to be particularly sacred because of the shed blood and the divided animals. However, in this particular vision, Abram 
slept. And while he slept, he saw a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. Genesis 15 verse 17. This symbolized God's presence passing back and forth between the slain animals. And the symbolism taught that this was a one-sided covenant. It meant that God was establishing it is on his own authority, entirely apart from Abram's input. And the most striking of this, this holy event was that fiery, fiery oven, signifying God's presence. Now this appearance of God in fire often repeats itself in the Old Testament. Think about God's appearance to Moses in the burning bush. Or the Lord's appearance on Mount Sinai, where the presence of God was symbolized by fire and thunder. Or by the cloud, who was fiery at night above his people on the way to Canaan. It signifies his holy presence. And therefore, no one was allowed to climb up the mountain to see what God was like, except for Moses, who was invited. If another person did, he or she would die. This is also what the author of Hebrews was thinking when he wrote at the end of chapter 12, For our God is a consuming fire. Verse 29. Thus, brothers and sisters, it is clear that in Pentecost, God Himself, in the third person, appeared to the church of the new covenant in fire. And this fire also has an effect. Because what does fire do? It does two things. First, fire brings light. Second, it gives warmth. Brothers and sisters, when we think about light, in our age, we tend to think about electricity. And to switch on the light with a switch for a bulb to light up. And then we forget that light, or that fire, is actually the source of light. In the ancient world, there was no electricity. So light came either by the sun, or by fire, or a lamp. So when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples of Pentecost, the first experience they had was what we would call spiritual illumination. God came as fire. God came in power. And God's Spirit came with light. And that's why Peter could preach such a persuasive sermon. He understood the Old Testament as he had not understood it before. And he was given the ability to preach, to preach it to enlighten those who heard him. The same thing happens in PNG or wherever the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached. It always brings enlightenment. We think that we live in a, in a fairly bright age after the 18th century enlightenment in Europe. Oh, beloved, we forget how dark the world actually is we are living in. And in Jesus' days, it was the same. The times of the Pax Romana, the Roman Empire. We sometimes glorify the days of the Roman Empire, for instance, probably because of the Hollywood movies like Ben-Hur or The Gladiator. Or we think of the Greek philosophers and reflect on how enlightened the Greeks must have been. But beloved, they were not enlightened. Of course, they were sparks of brilliance. Greek philosophers like Plato and Socrates were brilliant. But even Plato himself said that philosophers are like men in a dark cave. They look, look toward the opening and see certain shapes Illuminate from behind, silhouettes. But they 
cannot really tell what they are. The times of Jesus and afterwards are dark times. And the people, the Greek people of those times were living in darkness. They couldn't even keep up with the different gods as Paul discovered at the Areopagus in Athens. And this indicates only the reality that is true for then and true for today. Darkness. Apart from God's self-revelation, men and women have no more than the faint idea who God is. They live in darkness. But then came fire. Then comes light. The gospel of light. And suddenly people can see as they could see, could not see before. And then suddenly they, they see who God is and what the gospel is. And they discover what truth is. That's what happened at Pentecost. And that's why without that light, we are nothing. We can't see anything apart from Jesus Christ and the light that came into this world through Himself and His Spirit. And therefore, the Lord Jesus said on one occasion, that's Luke 12, verse 49, I came to send fire on earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. And where it relates to the words spoken by John the Baptist in Matthew 3, verse 11, where John said, I baptize you with water, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So when Jesus said that he had come to pour fire on the earth, he meant a fire that was destined to sweep all over the earth. And he said this because he knew that he will send his apostles with the great commission. He said in Acts 1 verse 8, But you shall receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samar Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That's how powerful the fire burns on this earth. And didn't this prophesied expansion of the Christian gospel begin at Pente Pentecost? That's why Acts 2 verse 9 to 11 talks about the many people who were present in Jerusalem and who heard the gospel of their own language on that day. So many people were caught in this fire. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya joining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. All these people from, from all over the Roman Empire and even beyond that, they were enlightened by the fire of Pentecost. And then they left Jerusalem and they went back to their places. And the fire spread throughout the world in all directions like ripples on a pond. Therefore the fire of Pentecost was, so to speak, the enlightening of the New Testament church. Beloved, fire not only brings light, fire also brings warmth. Second important use of fire in the ancient world was for warmth. If you were a Bedouin camped out by night in the desert, you had a fire. You draw, drew near to keep yourself warm. And so many of us do the same in these cold winter months. We light up our fireplaces to warm the house. And in the same way, when the Holy Spirit is at work, with that fire, one thing people notice is the warming of one's heart. 
problem is not just that the world we know is in darkness, except where the gospel is spread. The world is certainly in darkness, as black as any night with the sun, when the sun goes down. But the world is also out in the cold. It's unwarmed, uncomforted, until God, after whom our hearts long and in whose image we are made, draws near to warm us. And is that not also our task? To be a light on a stand, but also a warming flame to the gospel in this world? So what do we take home this morning from these two signs? Oh, beloved, when the Holy Spirit powerfully works in the church, what we are to have is not some particularly intense experience. Yes, we can be amazed by the, this phenomenon and trying to grasp the signs in our spiritual imagination as we, so to speak, hear the wind or or see the tongues on fire on the disciples' heads, or, or hear the followers of the ascended Lord experiencing speaking and wonder hearing. But the most important here is that the Spirit empowers us to have a widespread speaking about Jesus Christ. Our community needs to hear the gospel spreading through the testimony of those who received wind and fire, who received and obeyed the great commission of Christ. That is what you and I are called upon to do faithfully. That is the task to which the Lord Jesus Christ calls us on Pentecost 2015. And for this task, He 2,000 years ago powerfully sent His Spirit with wind and fire. Today we don't experience the same signs in the same way. Yet we celebrate Pentecost again. And we celebrate it with the power of the Lord. For the Lord grants no less power to our witness than before. For Christ promised that His Spirit will remain with us until the last day. Therefore, as believers who are filled with the Spirit, let us be His mouthpiece for the edifying and upbuilding, also for new members of the New Testament Church. And most of all, for the glory of Christ and His Spirit. Amen.